Good morning to everybody. Uh, welcome to Ideal Park Church. If you're a regular here, we're glad to see you. If you are visiting, we are really glad to see you. And um, make sure that you talk to all of us and we talk to you. First thing I'm going to go on to is our fishing trip. We had our fishing trip this last week up to Morty Young's Cottage. We had an absolutely great time. Uh, the big fish weren't biting real good, but the pan fish were doing pretty good if you were with Maury or Noah DeYoung. If you were in my boat or anybody else's boat that didn't know where to fish, there weren't that great of fishing going on there. We were happy to see some couples that came up Wednesday and Thursday. Um, we had some good crowds. We're really, really pleased with what happened there. Um, we got to go with that on the way back from the fishing trip Wednesday night, and we're in a car accident. Um, they were broadsided when somebody uh, ran a stop sign. Thankfully, they're both okay, and the person that hit them is okay. Not Can't see much for your Jeep, right? <laughs> Um, we want to continue to pray for my wife, Linda. There's really no change in what's going on with her. It's a slow process of getting everything working there. Um, we want to say, glad to see here. Where'd you guys go? You were sitting there a minute ago. There we are, way back there. I'm not used to you sitting back there. I'm used to you right up here. I talked to Dave. He said his kidney is starting to work a little bit. Betty had her gallbladder out, and she looks like she's doing pretty good. So we're really happy to see you guys here. Um, we got uh, had some chest pains uh, Thursday, maybe, was it? Thursday or Friday? Um, he went to emergency. It wasn't heart-related. It was more digestive-related. Um, he is home resting right now. So please pray for Herb. Has pneumonia. Um, on top of everything else that's going on, um, we need to pray for them, and he won't need to get the pneumonia cleared up so he can have some surgery on his back later on here. Um, Wednesday the 18th, we will bring... bring oh, I ain't going to say we, that ain't me. The ladies are bringing stuff down from upstairs in the activity center to get ready for the second best sale. Uh, setup will be Friday the 20th, and then Tuesday the 23rd and 24th with the sale the 25th through the 26th and the 27th. Um, ladies Bible study is going to start up here shortly. Um, that's in what, first week of October? Yes, okay. Uh, this Monday night, Monday afternoon, the search committee is meeting again here in church. Um, if you have some concerns or want to talk to one of the members of the church committee, please do that. Tuesday will be the council meeting, Tuesday night. So if there's anything that you think your elders or deacons need to talk about, please make sure you see us. And let's see, uh, I think we got, oh, one more thing. Nyla's 29th birthday is today. <laughs> Happy birthday, Nyla. <laughs> Pat Nagels? Oh, yes. Yes, ma'am. You, you must be 23 then. <laughs> 60. Okay. Uh, I don't know if you all heard that, but um, I had was going to have her foot amputated, but they ended up taking it off within three inches of the knee. But she is being transferred to Blodgett, and everything seems to be going good at this point. I am up, obviously. <laughs> good morning, everyone. Again, even though you are greeted by Tom, I would like to say, 
welcome to each and every one of you here in this room and also those who are watching and joining us later in the recorded version of service online, whether you are visitors or members of this church, family, friends, whoever you are, wherever you are and wherever you are coming from, you are all Welcome to the morning service today at Ideal Park CRC, and I would like to say a special thanks to you uh, by, uh, because you have me again here and give me this opportunity and, and grant me this privilege again to share uh, uh, the presence of God together as God's people, to share the Word of God today. Yeah. Especially this call to worship is from one of my favorite Psalms, as this particularly reminds me of who I am as a worshiper, why I worship the Lord as a Christian. So listen very carefully from Psalm 95 verses 1 through 7 as a call to worship. It says, Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before Him with thanksgiving and extol Him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all kings. In His hands are the depth of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to Him. The sea is His, for He made it, and His hands formed the dry land. So come. Let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker, for He is our God. And we are here, the people of His pasture, the flock under His care. People of God, this is the reason why we're here. We worship God. Of course, we remember all the blessings and, and everything that the Lord has done, just like I shared a testimony, and we praise because of that. But even if, even if we do not feel that, we do not see that, even at that moment, we praise God and worship God because of who our God is. He is still great. He is merciful. He is mighty who generously embraces us as His people under His care, this compassionate care. So we are here in that presence and we worship the Lord joyfully today. So people of God, I would like to invite you to stand joyfully in your body and in your spirit as you are able because our God wants to greet us with these words, grace, mercy, and peace in abundance upon you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ who is the head of the church and from the Holy Spirit who is working among, through, and within us today. And all God's people said together, Amen. As our God is greeting us before we sing together in order to come to our God as one united in love and truth of Christ, let us share the same love together among ourselves.
Please be seated. Jake's going to come up here again. He's going to lead the rest of the service. I, I'm just a figurehead up here. You know, I just came because Herb asked me to come and lead the singing. I didn't even wave my arms because you were doing great. You, you didn't need any direction at all. So great to hear you singing. It's great to be here today. It's always good to see your faces and to worship with you. It's a great pleasure. And now, Jake, come on up here and lead us again in the rest of the worship today. It's really good to have you here and Thank you. have you lead us. You guys are stuck with me today, huh? <laughs> well, I wouldn't call it stuck. <laughs> <laughs> and Carol, thank you very much for the song choices that already preached my sermon, so I don't know if I have to. <laughs> it's time for a call to confession. As you can see in the bulletin, uh, we see Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2. It says, Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. Well, we, as we desire to dwell in the presence of of God today and go deeper into this intimate relationship with Him, not only today, but forevermore. Let us take some time for a confession today. We confess our sins just as addressed in the same chapter, Isaiah 59, verse 12. Let me read it for you. It confess, for our offenses are many in your sight, and our sins testify against us. Our offenses are ever with us, and we acknowledge our iniquities. So we are going to take a moment of silence intentionally today to look back on what we have done and left undone in our words and in our actions, in our thoughts, and even in our emotions. Let's think about that even not only the last week, but even this morning up to this far. There's something that we have done probably so let us look back in, in His grace confidently what something that we have done and left undone, whether intentionally or unintentionally, whether knowingly or unknowingly. So let us give ourselves humbly to the Lord in repentance. So let us have a moment of silence in prayer. Brothers and sisters in Christ, please listen to this word from book of Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 10, and embrace this message as an assurance of pardon as it speaks about our identity as the church, the body of Christ, forgiven and saved. It says, but because of His great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with Him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages He might show the incomparable reaches of His grace expressed in His kindness to us in Christ Jesus." For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. 
So now as we are created in Christ Jesus for good works, representing God's goodness and faithfulness as his masterwork, as his handiwork here, let us take another time to proclaim his good news and his uh, goodness and faithfulness with a, with a song together. We'll sing, I know not why God's wondrous grace together. Let's sing. This is time for congregational prayer. Let's take this moment as an opportunity to go to God together in prayer. Let's pray. Dear God, who listens, we are coming to you in prayer as your church, sharing one heart in one faith and one spirit. Thanks to your attentive presence, we have come this far through valleys of the shadow of death Thank you for watching over us dearly as your handiwork and calling us together, together as one body in Christ for another round of encouragement, nourishment, and empowerment in your word and spirit so that our lives can be overflowed with your love and grace. God, we are also grateful for calling us to pray as we know and believe that you are working so mysteriously and marvelously through prayers of your people. Thank you for inviting us to pray and that way participate in your grand redemptive plan through prayers. This time, we enjoy this responsibility in prayers for your righteousness and your kingdom. So Lord, hear our prayer this morning as we bring our hearts together to you as your church. First of all, we'd like to say thanks for your constant presence and provision for your people. Thank you for the wonderful weather and meaningful time together last week throughout the annual fishing trip. We pray that times like this continue to bear much fruit for our own growth as your beloved children, as your disciple, and as your church, but also drawing others close to the communion in Christ as well. Also, we are, we are thinking of in prayer and also as well after uh, this uh, terrifying and frustrating surgery of amputation. Continue to be with them in their uh, ongoing medical journey, providing what they need, not only medically and physically, but also emotionally, financially, and spiritually. God, we are thankful for your protection you provide also for 
from the scary car accident last week. Lord, we pray that you strengthen their body that must have been shocked without knowing so it may not develop any following pain. Also, the process with an insurance and car replacement can be frustrating. So, Lord, be with them and let the process be smooth and quick, giving them peace and joy and comfort. And also, please remember in a special way today as he just went through this severe chest pains and quick medical treatment last Friday and We are thankful for the presence of medical help and also a relieving news that it is not a heart issue for now, but there's still concern and it can be discouraging and even that terrifying to him and his family. So be with them in your peace and comfort and bring them clear understanding to be assured about where they're at medically and also a positive progress in his healing process continually. Lord, we pray for those who are not in the prayer prayer list and not spoken out loud today, but those in our hearts and our minds as well. Remember our friends and family members who are having ongoing problems and pains, especially who do not know you yet in in the midst of troubles. With your goodness and faithfulness, please guide them through the times of difficulties and lead them to your presence and joy of your deliverance. Lord, we pass, as we pass through the summer and get into this new season, we ask for your strength and protection. In this transitional season, many become vulnerable in health, getting cold, flu, COVID, and others. And some may feel depressed by saying goodbye to summer, and others feel grief and loss by sending out their children to college or to their homes as new school year is starting And along with all these transitions in life, we already begin to hear shooting incidents here and there that even happened in school. And we hear ongoing agony and pains of various kinds by natural disasters and and all the human disasters, unfortunately, for various reasons across the state and across the entire world. The list is endless, which even depresses us when we focus on them and discourages us in fear, anxiety, and exhaustion. So Lord, have your mercy on us. Continue to spread out your mercy and grace across the world, especially those who are brokenhearted, guiding them to your comforting presence. And protect your children in your powerful, righteous right hand. Hold us fast and strengthen us to keep striving heavenward even more in prayer. Whenever the world seems to be hopeless and helpless, let us pray even more in faith and trust in your promise, awaiting for your kingdom, built upon your uh, your righteousness and justice. So whenever we feel powerless, Lord, let us behold your glory that still fills the entire universe despite brokenness of this world and even brokenness of ourselves. So we pray that you fill us with your glory under the guidance of the Spirit of God so that we may rise and shine your light in our words and in our actions wherever we go and whatever we do. Lord, empower your church with your word and spirit. Impart the gifts and talents for your name and glory so we as your church faithfully and powerfully represent you. Represent your mercy where there is no forgiveness, your grace where there is no hope, your joy where there are tears, your compassion where there is bitterness, your companionship where there is loneliness, and your comfort where there is no peace. For this, Lord, use Ideal Park CRC. Let this church be the channel of your love and the gospel of Jesus Christ for everyone to whom you called them to serve inside and outside the church, just as you provide reins for both the evil and the righteous. Remember prayers of your people here in this church and all the efforts and events that the church has provided and is planning to provide like this coming church sale. Let the community in person and online be blessed by Ideal Park Church and find their true identity as your handiwork in Christ. And when you are willing, Lord, please reward Ideal Park congregation with joy of salvation and the revival according to the riches of your glory. So, Lord, continue to strengthen your church, not to be weary in doing good until they reap the harvest of joy and righteousness in abundance. 
So Lord, together as your church, we'd like to continue to grow into the fullness of Christ in our life together so that we may not be ashamed before you and before the world as we gather in the truth and the love of Christ as one body, embracing people in your grace and mercy. With this desire in our hearts, we come before you today to worship and to follow you. So soften our hearts as we listen to your word and nourish our soul to keep marching on together as your people by the help of the spirit of truth. It is in the name of Jesus who called us to be the salt and the light of the world that we pray together. Amen. This is time for offering, an opportunity for us to give our gratitude to the Lord with everything that we have. We uh, have an offering for a general fund and benevolence fund today. And for no easy offering, we will be thinking about Aster School in Zambia as well. Let's go to God.
The scripture passage that God gives us today is from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 14, which you can find in the Pew Bible, page 1113. 1113 in your Pew Bible from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 14. This is the Apostle Paul carried along by the Holy Spirit. Um, The the Word of God speaks through him. So hear the Word of God. Now about spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that when you were pagans, somehow or other, you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I tell you that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed, and no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works all of them in all men. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one, there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom. To another, the message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers, to another, prophecy, to another, distinguishing between spirits, to another, speaking in different kinds of tongues, and to still another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and He gives them to each one just as He determines. The body is a unit Though it is made up of many parts, and though all its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Now the body is not made up of one part, but of many. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So as I shared a little bit at the beginning of the service today, when I was in my undergrad, I was a chapel worship director. And part of my job was to lead the chapel service and formulate and train worship team accordingly to lead the chapel service. And it was quite successful, I'd like to say, because all the worship team members were an emerging church leaders who were majoring in theology with me or any other majors that are really closely related to the ministry of some sort for the church. We were gathering together not only for chapel service, but weekly gathering for our devotionals, for our life together. So we had a lot of time of fun and, and, and meaningful times in the Lord. Especially, there are a lot of students who really wanted to join this team so as to experience some safe and sound church community according to their feedback. So that in and of itself showed, shows that the, the worship community, the chapel worship team showed an example of such community. However, the reality was different from what it appeared. That's what I'm going to share with you. Though the formal an informal gathering of the team and their performance in the service looked really mature and wonderful, full of fun and joy. It was actually tainted deeply with this jealousy, desire for popularity among friends. As people began to speak very highly of the team, some members in the team began to look for acclamation in the school community. And for this reason, they began to be jealous of other members in the team who seem to have better qualities in their musical skills, in their relational skills, thus have better reputation in the school. 
And because of that jealousy, this jealous group in the team even created rumors to steal their honor and fame, claiming that they are better, enjoying gossiping and shaming one another so falsely. In appearance, in that regard, they might have presented a beautiful music in the chapel, on song and on the stage, and also presented this truthful and joyful life together that everyone wanted to join. But what they actually did was not praise nor worship, but a mere singing and playing music for themselves. The worship service and the team's gathering in this regard were neither pleasing nor fragrant to God. Then what about the worship community in Corinth? The church in Corinth was located in one of the biggest ports in the Middle East area, at least at the time, really, where a variety of people from different cultures expected to come, come across and mingle together, share life together there. And as you can imagine, those who are coming from different cultures, just like me in front of you, are bringing some different ideas and views as well. And unfortunately, all those sensitive ideas about politics, about morality, about theology, which inevitably caused conflicts and confusions at that time. And the church in Corinth, unfortunately, could not avoid this cultural influence. They might have presented themselves in a very healthy way at first in order to stand pure and firm in Christ, discerning what is false and true teaching among all that, discerning how to live as a Christian here and there faithfully when it comes to this matter and that matter. However, their discerning process certainly becomes soon after all about power battle. They became very harshly exclusive to one another, not only to those who are outside of the church community, but also to those who were inside. So the crashing among themselves became like, hey, where are you coming from? What skills do you have? And how are you good at that? How wealthy are you? What is your social status outside the church? So who deserved, therefore, the power, authority, and honor, and privilege in the church. So they keep looking for who is under and who is above themselves. And of course, out of this human desire to stand above everyone else, they even began to shame one another, disregarding especially those who are considered inferior in society according to worldly measures and according to worldly values. So, of course, this created significant divisions in the church of Corinth. They, lo- they, are, they were losing this identity as the church. For example, in chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians, probably you can recall it, uh, someone in the congregation claimed, I am righteous because I follow Apollos, the greatest teacher of all. And then the other group of people, of course, said, I am better, I am righteous, because I learned under the Apostle Paul, the greater teacher of all. And of course, in addition to all of that, you can see after chapter 3, there are a lot of rich people in the congregation coming to the communion table, eating up all the bread and wine before the poor congregation comes in to join the table. And even some people showed off their gifts, used their talents just to say, you are wrong, and I'm right before God. I am better, obviously. So imagine that people in the church, you're coming into the lobby, and you see there are a lot of people serving one another with great wisdom, with great smiles and incomparable hospitality here and there. But the real intention behind is just to show off just to feel good about themselves, just to claim their authority to be above others. In this way, the Corinthian church were gradually losing the point of gathering, the point of argument. 
There was no love nor truth anymore at that point, but only this desire to be superior to others out of jealousy of power and privilege in the church. And unfortunately, this became the primary principle of their community. From my personal experience, I can see the same problem of jealousy is still in power, unfortunately, many times in the church. After this awful division experience in my undergrad, I could have this chance to serve uh, one particular church in South Korea as a worship pastor. And I still remember their distinctive power dynamic in the church. So I'd like to share a little bit of that. And by the way, this church does not exist in the world anymore, so I can share a little bit freely. So for your understanding, it was the church that two different congregations merged together because of their financial issues and their administrative, uh, administrative problems. And the church was divided, unfortunately, exactly into two different groups according to the previous congregations. And of course, they argued one another about who is going to be an elder, who is holding an office, who is going to be the deacon in the church and therefore hold this power, this honor, and this privilege. And obviously, they neglected about the humble service aspect of it. And because of this, there was always some level of tension behind smile faces in their gathering. And to make a story worse, even the lead pastor and his wife were also divided accordingly over not only about their theological views and how, how they want to do the church, that serious issues, but also over very minor things like whether they want to close the curtain or not during the service. And they do that so harshly in front of congregation, taking advantage of staff and manpower and, and, and associate pastors in front of congregation, speaking so harshly for a curtain. So that was their situation at the time, and that worked really well with each group of people, as you can imagine, because people now can claim, hey, I follow pastor for this curtain issue. No. I follow wife, she knows better. <laughs> that happened, really, in reality. And, and the truth about the church office or the identity of the church, they're gone. That didn't matter anymore, but only the concern about the power and privilege at the expense of love and truth. This dynamic created the sin during worship service that is so hilarious and also tragic. During the worship service, they praised together, made a beautiful harmony, of course, and many of them showed how fervently they are committed to God through these passionate worship gestures, like singing so out loud with their hands lifted high all the time, praying so out loud, kneeling down on the center aisle sometimes, and they're just running around showing these pious gestures and postures. However, when you get to the bottom of it, now you know a little bit of the church. You can see that all these, at least many of them, were just the means to say, hey, see how pious I am? Hey, see how I am qualified to be a leader? My church group, therefore, should gain the power in this church. I should be the one above everyone else. When one group seems to do better at this, that triggered other group, of course. Jealousy triggered them to fake themselves even more dramatically. So it looked very vibrant and really devout in appearance, but obviously was not pleasing nor fragrant to God at all. The reality was that they lost the point of their gathering. There was no love of God, nor love of others, but only this love of self. The desire to be superior to others out of this jealousy of power and privilege. So it became the pr pr primary principle of their community. The Apostle Paul also recognized the similar problems 
in Corinth. He strongly argues throughout the letter against every each one of issues as they all were mingled with worldly ideas, values, and measurements. So his teaching about the spiritual gifts today in chapter 12 can be understood in this context. So today I'm not going to necessarily go through the list of spiritual gifts, but rather why he was writing it. What's the emphasis? What's the word that he is repeating here so that we can understand the context and get the lesson from it? While acknowledging the overwhelming diversity in Corinth, Paul says in verses 4 through 7 and verse 13, if you have your Bible open, then you can follow that. Let me read it for you. But focus on the repetition of words. He says, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in every one, it is the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. For we were all baptized by one Spirit so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one Spirit to drink. So Paul is basically teaching that, hey, it shouldn't be about right or wrong. It shouldn't be about better or worse anymore among yourselves. You became a new self by the Spirit of God here, and now you are one body in the same baptism and the same Spirit. Varieties of gifts, all those differences that you have are not given for your power battle to feed your jealousy or to compare, compete, and condemn one another for your privilege. They are rather gifts given for you, for your good as one same body in the same Lord, Jesus Christ. So Apostle Paul, for that reason, in that context, teaches about the unity and diversity following by using one body analogy, as you can see. And he teaches, he reaches to the climax at this famous chapter in the Bible, the first Corinthians chapter 13, which is also known as the chapter of love, right? So Paul is saying, follow the way of love, not the way of the world and its broken value system because you are now one body in the same spirit. Differences are given as the gifts, the greatest gift for the church with which you can practice love of Christ much better and much deeper. When you are united in Christ with all those differences, then you can begin to embrace the marginalized and the stigmatized in society into Christ and bring more people from the wider community into the truth. So Paul is here awakening the church of Corinth from this jealous desire to this better spiritual reality. The body of Christ is called to serve and to love one another through and beyond their differences, through and beyond their level of wealth, through and beyond their social status, through and beyond their cultural identities, through and beyond their different talents and personalities. For such a harmony in love and the truth, the Spirit of God empowers the church with various gifts so everyone without exception, can find themselves in Christ, unlike they couldn't in the world. Today, this same spirit is calling us, different people, to the same way of life where the love and truth of Christ become the primary principle of the community. To describe this, one pastor that I know back in South Korea gave me this analogy. He said, It is like an orchestra. So you see, a little bit blurry here, but see the conductor's hands for your help. It is like an orchestra. According to his analogy, the orchestra can be played and held in public under these four conditions. The first condition is player, the different instrumentalists who are playing orchestra, 
And music score, that's the second condition out of which the, the players are playing the same music together. And the conductor, who is gluing them together in the same vision, interpreting the words and the music score, guiding uh, instrumentalists. And the audience, who is listening to this beautiful harmony that they make and appreciate the music. So picture this. There are different kinds of players, different uh, instrumentalists holding different instruments. And each player, they play music not to show off. They work so intentionally together. They are not working to get all the spotlight on themselves, but to make a beautiful harmony together as one entity. For this, they work together, again, intentionally listening so carefully to one another, even breathing out together, looking at one another, and understand, trying to understand their different um, characteristics of different instruments. And they play the song according to the music score that's right in front of them, that is written in the same principle for the same purpose. And this is to be done under the same direction of the same conductor who glues them together under the same direction and the same vision. Then it makes this harmonious orchestra, which will be appreciated by the audience deeply. Now, in this image, we can understand spiritually that the players as worshipers the players are worshipers who are having different gifts, just like players having different instruments on themselves. But they gather together with all those characteristics and differences in harmony so intentionally and very compassionately and attentively for that. They follow and play faithfully the word of God, their music score which is written in the same principle, the principle of love of Christ for the glory of God, the same purpose. This orchestra of the church, this life together as the church is guided by the direction of the same spirit, our conductor, the Holy Spirit who teaches every each one of us how to play faithfully the truth of the word of God in their lives. And then this is appreciated by the one and only audience of the church, our God, who is worthy to be praised by the church. This full orchestra, this life together as a church is unprecedentedly colorful and powerful, if you can imagine. Remember our Lord Jesus. Jesus himself also showed an example of this colorful and powerful community by embracing differences into his love in the way of truth. His work was not about power, was not about jealousy, was not about honor and, and, and privilege at the expense of love and truth, but that was only about love and truth. And interestingly, the reason to accuse Jesus at the time was jealousy, was power, was honor, was privilege at the expense of love and truth. Many were turning a deaf ear to the truth out of selfish desire to keep holding on to the power and privilege that they had at the moment, triggered by jealousy over one another and eventually over Jesus, their Lord. On the other hand, Jesus showed how to guide others into the truth, in the way of love. And with that, the Holy Spirit also expanded this love of Christ from the land of Israel to the entire world in order to launch this colorful and powerful community despite differences. And now I need to say, because of differences. Jesus wanted to embrace differences that were simply condemned at the time in society at the expense of love and truth, knowing that differences will rather deepen and even complete his love and truth. So he intended us to live so radically inclusive in that way. However, we need to remember this also faithfully exclusive way of life in his truth. So before our righteous and loving God, 
We are called to this way of life that is so powerful that the world has admired and tried so hard to make themselves the same version in their own way. But if you can remember the history, the world has failed. You know, it has been either unity that is harshly excluding diversity at the expense of love or simple diversity without unity at the expense of truth. The community of the loving unity and the truthful diversity in Christ, that's what we are called to be. So our God wants us to be attentive, not aggressive, wants us to be compassionate, not competing and criticizing so simply, to be collaborating one another, not comparing and condemning so that we can make different voices and sounds harmonious in the same song of love and truth of Christ. So to each and every one of us, Jesus has already given the same spirit with different gifts through different experiences, through different social status, different interests, different level of knowledge or wisdom, different personalities. You can name it, right? But through all of those differences, we can grow mature in Christ to his fullness, In this way, we can stand firm in this chaotic world as one strongly united in reaches of the love and truth of Christ, which will, of course, powerfully bring other people to Christ. This is the community of Jesus, the most colorful and the most powerful community in the world where his love and his truth are the primary principle, the foundation of life together. So I pray today that we may continue to examine ourselves and practice and play this way of life, our given orchestra as a church, by the power of the Spirit and the truth of the Word of God. So may we be the living sacrifice to the Lord through this life of worship that is pleasing and fragrant to our God. Let's go to God in prayer. Dear God of love, thank you for bringing us together into your love as one body. We were once alienated from God and and from one another, but now in your powerful love, we become the community of children of God. We were once enemies of God and strangers, quick and ready to stand against one another, but now in Christ, we become one body standing in your love and truth. This is our identity that we want to hold on to on our journey of faith in the midst of challenges and threats of our enemies. This is the spiritual reality that we want to commit ourselves to live out faithfully and joyfully in the midst of all the various lies of this world that keep sneaking into our lives. So Lord, we pray as your people, holding our citizenship in heaven, that you may empower us in our gathering to diligently learn and practice your love so that we can keep marching onto your kingdom, the nation of love that is built upon the truth. Help us play and sing the song of love and truth together by the power of your spirit, communally and also individually, inside and outside the church, wherever we go and whatever we do, so we can represent this colorful and powerful kingdom of God in every corner of society so faithfully and powerfully. Work among and through us so especially those who are marginalized and stigmatized can find their ways to Christ and find themselves in Christ. And you alone be glorified when your people from the entire world rejoice in their life together as one body centered on your love and truth. In Jesus' name and in the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Please rise in your body and spirit as we are going to respond with the song, In Christ There is No East or West.
before we close in song, we have this God's blessing. And, but of course, for your reminder, I'm not ordained yet, so I'm not going to raise my hands all the way up high in the air. But rather, let me read two verses from 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11 and verse 14, as they are relatable to our message today. Receive this as God's blessing. Brothers and sisters, rejoice, strive for full restoration, encourage one another, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.